Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Football Outsiders live stream and podcast. I'm Aaron Schatz, Editor-in-Chief of FootballOutsiders.com. Uh, it is July 14th, 2022. I am joined today by Mike Tanier and by J.P. Acosta, and we're going to do another show previewing the brand new Football Outsiders Almanac 2022 available from our site for all FO Plus subscribers and available as of this afternoon on Amazon.com. Those of you who still read books on dead trees and want to get a whole collection on your bookshelf like Mike and I have, you can now order the book. That's not the book. That's the book from four years ago, but it looks like that, only it's yellow and blue for the Rams winning the Super Bowl, and it's Ooh. got a bunch of current data in it. So you definitely want to order that on Amazon if you want the book. Uh, before we get into the team previews for the Indianapolis Colts and the Jacksonville Jaguars, we're going to do a question of the day and pose it to Mike and JP and to you, the listening audience. And today's question of the day is, how many passing touchdowns will Matt Ryan throw this year? He had 20 last year. He had 26 the two years before that. How did he throw 20 touchdowns last year? Who, who caught these Man. <laughs> That's what I was about to ask. He's throwing to Kyle Pitts, Cordero Patterson, and my baby brother out there. Olamide <laughs> Zacchaeus, baby. All the Olamide Zacchaeus. What's <laughs> remarkable is that Ryan threw 20 touchdowns, and only one of them, I believe, was to Kyle Pitts. It will not be that way this year. Remember, because Kyle Pitts is replacing Julio Jones in the offense as the guy who never catches a touchdown. So, ah. yeah, so that made perfect sense to me. But I'm glad I'm glad Derek is not on the podcast because his answer would be a hundred million touchdowns. I think. He's very big on what Matt Ryan can do in the Frank Reich offense. Yes, yes, yes. The crush is real. I uh, love you, Derek. Uh, but let's see. I, I, I'll go with. Huh, it's. It's hard to say. I think they're going to run the ball out the goal line. I don't think they'll be very good, and we'll talk about that later. I don't know who besides Michael Pittman is going to be his go-to guy as a receiver. And yet he's probably going to throw the ball a lot. So I'm going to I'm going to go up at about a little rebound from last year, back to the previous year's 25 touchdowns. Um I think I'm gonna go 26. I have a pretty good feeling about the pretty good feeling about this offense. I I really love Michael Pittman as a receiver, um, but like you said, there are a lot of questions still in that in that receiver room, especially when you go down the depth chart. Their wide receiver two right now is Alec Pierce, second round rookie from Cincinnati. Wow! And then you're getting into Michael Mike Strawn and <laughs> Ashton Doolin, special teamers and seventh round picks who haven't played a snap at all. So that depth chart's not looking very good. They're going to have to rely a lot more on Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines in the passing game, which we haven't really seen Jonathan Taylor in the passing game, for real. Right. But I do think he'll bounce back from throwing 20 touchdowns to the JV offense that is the Atlanta Falcons. So Don't you forget that folks can make comments if you are watching us on Twitch or YouTube live. We can he get your comments and uh, – I will say, speaking of Matt Ryan and Atlanta last year, Colonel Kurtz says he has a bone to pick with us from the unit grade shows that we gave the Falcons. Uh, the grades we gave to the Falcons were too good. Oh, I believe they were well, almost how, all D's and F's. <laughs> well, how can we get past the noted super weapon Felipe Franks? I mean, we got we got to give him respect. The quarterback, <laughs> tight end, receiver. The man is a mo he is a modern day Taysom Hill. My theory on the Falcons, and again, this happened during the shows, everyone is counting Kyle Pitts as a tight end and a receiver and Cordero Patterson as a running back and a receiver, and therefore they're really deep. It's like, no, they're not deep. They're incredibly shallow. Everybody's doing two jobs. That And A.J. Terrell turned into Ronnie Lott during that show. And I know he's a, a good ball player, but oh, my gosh. Are we sure it wasn't that he has great charting stats because he's the only guy who's any good and then before they threw to everyone else? I do appreciate that the Falcons have decided to go for – we're not going to go for any shifty receivers. Everybody's going to be 6'3 <laughs> to 6'6. Six, six. We're just going to dunk on people. Yeah, they would win a charity, bas charity basketball game. They would win a charity oh, basketball yeah. game. Oh, yeah. If I'm choosing a receiver unit to play five-on-five, five, I'm choosing the Falcons. <laughs> 
I will point out that Matt Ryan's Kubiak projection is for 23 touchdowns, but that is assuming the possibility of injury. So most of the quarterback projections, like not the book projections are all 17 games, right? Mm -hmm. The projections that are in the Kubiak app on the site are price in the possibility of injury. And so pricing in the possibility of injury means most quarterbacks are actually projected for like 16 games. So that that gives him 23 passing touchdowns. So mostly comes out about where you guys are. We're a little higher. We are a little higher than the projection there. A little higher. But I, that, I think that there might be someone out there who's in the 30 to 35 touchdown. They're going to, he's going to bounce back, maybe because they haven't watched the Falcons game since the Super Bowl, and they assume he's the same guy. And I would say anybody who's expecting that, you're probably a little high. So and let's man, talk. Sometimes. Just go ahead. Sometimes you possibly turn back. Sometimes you possibly turn back the clock. I don't think that clock's turning back for Matt Ryan. Though. <laughs> no. So let's talk about the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, as we talked about on Tuesday's show, the entire AFC South has an average projection below 500, and all the teams are very closely grouped together, which may surprise people when you think of the Colts were better than this last year and the Titans were better than this last year. But, um, you know, the Titans were not good in our numbers and lost some guys, and the Colts have made some changes. So they actually only come out with 7.9 mean wins. Mm. They make the playoffs 37% of the time, 20th projection on offense, 24th on defense. And we'll start with the receivers because like you said, JP, like the receiver room is really questionable. Michael Pittman, Matt Harmon loves Michael Pittman. Like thinks Michael Pittman is due for a massive breakout. The problem is, and then who else is there? Like Paris Campbell is vaporware (laughs) and – Alec Pierce doesn't have a very good playmaker score and expecting him to come in as a rookie and do really well seems like a lot of wish casting. Yeah. And then, yeah, then it's down to like Mike Strachan and Ashton Doolin and Kiki Kuti and a bunch of college street free agents. Uh, Yes. Paris Campbell, Campbell, by the way, is reportedly healthy right now. I'm just letting you know. He was right now. Right now. Call me in an hour and let me know how he's doing. Give it six weeks. He'll... He'll probably sprain an ankle in practice. (laughs) But I definitely think this wide receiver group outside of Michael Pittman is very much a projection. We're projecting Alec Pierce to – he has to be the second receiver in that offense. I think Frank Wright wants him to be that second receiver in the offense. That's why they took him in the second round. His profile in terms of as a receiver, his skill set, it mimics a lot of what Michael Pittman already does. He ran a 4-4 at the Combine, and I was shocked because you don't see that on tape. But he's very much a go-up-and-get-it, above-the-rim type of receiver. The problem is they don't have any other proven type outside of that type of receiver. I mean, again, Kiki Kuti played well for like four games for the Texans in the year that was lost, like 2019, 2020. Um, Mike Strawn, again, another one of the bigger type receivers. Yes. But again, this receiver group is largely based on, okay, we have to hope that um, Alec Pierce is a good second receiver. We have to hope Paris Campbell is healthy. We have to hope another receiver actually steps up. And this is even with, this is without T.Y. Hilton coming back, which I don't think is happening at this point. Yeah, if that's what you're banking on is, oh, Hilton's going to come back and still be that guy when he's been on a slow decline for a while. But you're right when you mention it. It's all boundary 50-50 ball type receivers. I kind of think that's what Pierce is. Pittman's more than that, but that's kind of what he is at the core. I got the profile strong a couple of years ago. I like the young man, but that's what he is. And he's very much a long range sort of like projection there. And the guys that aren't are Campbell, who is vaporware, and Cootie, who is Bill O'Brien's favorite binky fake Debo run 10 yards into the backfield to run the reverse guy a couple of years ago. I can't believe they're still running. I'd rather throw the ball to Naheem Hines than him. Certainly. Um, where, yeah. Where are these catches coming from? Overall, the projections are just so very meh for the Indianapolis Colts. I'm just looking at them. I'm, I'm well, at that's all. the whole AFC South. The whole AFC South is just meh. And so it's, this is no, no exception. It's a wasteland from hell. This is like <laughs> the AFC South is Mad Max. <laughs> There's nothing. There's no life there. 
But I do appreciate that the Colts have the largest tight end room I've ever seen assembled. Yeah. Mo Ali Cox and Jelani Woods are both like former basketball players who are six seven. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to be a good tight end group, but it's just going to be fun to see them trot out Pittman, Pierce, Woods, and Ali Cox, and again, just play basketball with teams. <laughs> I do love Jelani Woods. It's funny, though. They're a team that's built out of all the things you shouldn't build the car out of. Like, the Colts are great at guard and (laughs) off-ball linebacker and running back and slot corner. And it's not like these things are not important, but, like, those are all – those are the potatoes, and we're looking for for the steak here. And, and, you know, the steak, I guess, is Matt Ryan. Yeah, yeah, the the, the offensive line, depending on Matt Pryor to play left tackle, does not – feel like that is going to be a successful move. No, no. Yeah, I – when I was doing the research for the Almanac, I was actually kind of surprised at how bad this offensive line played last year outside of Quentin Nelson and Ryan Kelly, who both were often injured. Mm-hmm. I mean, Eric – they brought in Eric Fisher. Yeah, was, we know what Eric Fisher is at this point. Eric Fisher was bad. So yeah. now you're counting on Matt Pryor or Bernard Raymond, yeah. a rookie, to come in and step in and immediately be that left tackle for a quarterback in Matt Ryan – who does not move very much. Like he's, he can get out of the pocket, but he's not a spring chicken. I mean, this offensive line, I mean, you really need Quinn Nelson healthy. <laughs> like, I think it's like what Matt, what, like what Mike said, you're building the car, you got a real nice, like, steering wheel handle, you got the cool <laughs> little dice in the right. uh, on the mirror, nice muffler in the but wall. the engine's gone. <laughs> the engine's gone. You don't have any seats. <laughs> it, it's you're really just trying to you're trying to piece it together as good as well as possible and I feel like that's kind of been the crux of what the Colts have been doing since Andrew Luck retired they've been trying yes. to get the steering wheel they've been mm-hmm. trying to get the engine and every engine has been wrong yes there it's all about it certainly feels so go ahead it's all about look what we've done under the circumstances that we created for ourselves last year by the let, trying to save solve the circumstances from the previous year. It's never look at the forward propulsion of this, uh, of this franchise. It, it feels like they've built a good defense. When you look at the yeah. depth chart on defense, this projection looks like it might be too low. I will say a big part of the defensive projection is that they were at the top of the league or near the top of the league last year in turnovers per drive. Mm. Uh, I believe that they were number two tied for second. And that tends to, really regress to the mean heavily, which suggests their defense is going to get worse. When you look at the defense, you're like, oh, yeah, DeForest Buckner and Grover Stewart and Darius Leonard and Bobby Okarike, and they're, you know, reasonable at safety, and there's Kenny Moore, and there's some reasonable pass rushers with Yannick Nagakwe here now. Um, I think a lot depends on, one, how good is Stephon Gilmore at this point? Yes. And, two, who is playing opposite Stephon Gilmore, and how good are they? Right. So in the early projections, I think Brandon Faison is going to be playing opposite Stephon Gilmore. And he was targeted a lot in Las Vegas and he wasn't very good in Las Vegas. I do think it is hilarious bringing in Gus Bradley as as the switch up to Matt Eberflus cover two. (laughs) Right. Gus Bradley, we know what Gus Bradley is at this point. Cover three, single high. They're they're going to play cover three. That's that's exactly what's going to happen. They were first in the NFL in snaps where they rushed four and then dead last in anything above that. Like they're not they're not gonna blitz. They're right. going to be through Seattle cover three, which I think could possibly help the defensive line get more pressure because you're only focusing on one gap. Your okay. your role, Yannick Ngakwe, get to the quarterback. This could help Quiddy Pie because he's not necessarily seeing as much attention now on the edges and another year of development. DeForest Buckner is going to be DeForest Buckner. Darius Leonard is going to be Darius Leonard. That secondary is going to be an issue, though, outside of Stephon Gilmore. You're going to be counting on Nick Cross, third-round safety, to step in and be the -the around-the-box player. But then you don't have the deep safety, and you possibly don't have the second corner. Kenny Moore is great, but, again, you got a lot of complimentary stuff. But this defense is very reliant on outside corner, and you got to have a dude at free safety. Yeah, and it's going to be Rodney McLeod probably, who was great for the Eagles a couple of years ago and has been on the Eagles for a couple of years. He's not a terrible player by any means, but he's not like the dude at free safety. Yeah, he is He is 
a dude, not a the dude. Yeah, he's a guy, not the guy. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Right, the projections have the Colts, Titans, and Texans essentially all grouped together with the Jaguars only slightly behind them. <laughs> Which team, I mean, subjectively, do you think the Colts are the favorite in this division? I mean, I think so, just because of – I think the Titans are going to regress offensively. I mean, if they're projecting me like seven wins. Seven might win you the division in the AFC South. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe like seven to eight wins for this team. It's, it's a very mad team that's going to be reliant on Matt Ryan suddenly finding the spark again. And somebody on defense stepping up opposite Stephon Gilmore. Let me give you a couple of uh, prop bets in answer to that question. Uh, the Colts' chances of missing the playoffs. You can get the Colts missing the playoffs at plus 140. I don't know. So now say you are more sanguine about the Colts. Losing in the wild card round, so specifically losing in the wild card round at plus 200. I kind of like that one the best. I'll give you another one here. Colts to lose in the divisional round. Now, we were talking last week with Derek. Colts to lose in the divisional round at plus 330. I feel like Derek Klassen would jump on that. That seems to be the range he's in. Well, plus 330, you could tempt me on that. And then it, it goes up from there, et cetera. But sounds like we're in that range. It sounds like Vegas is in that same range where we're looking at this team that's going to barely scrape into the playoffs. I believe it more because of all the like bad news I've heard out of Tennessee in terms of Traylon Burks not being able to practice and things like that than any of the good news I'm hearing out of Indianapolis. Yeah, they could they could win the division, but like I said, seven wins might win you the division in AFC South. This is hell, essentially. <laughs> that this, this is the worst division in football. Yeah. Colonel Kurt says Colts are the favorite. If they have the 2017 to 18 Ryan, that's enough to get them the title pending Lawrence living up to his billing. Titans are really well coached, but their wide receiver room is terrible. It is. It is. It is really terrible. And the Colts are very well coached, which is going to help them through some of this as well. Hmm. You, want to, you want to hear one quick uh, off topic? Listen to this prop bet. I'm not going to be here probably for this session. Over 10 wins for the Minnesota Vikings at plus 220. Good God. Our, our projection system loves that. Bet. <laughs> our projection system loves that bet. All right. Keep that in the mind. The back pocket, I'm than, not here. We do Vikings. We're going to more than triple uh, more than triple your money. Yeah. They our projection system loves that bet. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. And I, I'm feeling it about the Vikings, which is saying something. I mean, I don't think it's super like is it 10 or more or more than 10? Let me double check the wording because you're yeah, exactly right. It is over 10, so you got to get to 11. Hmm. It's over 10. Our projection yeah. still our projection system still likes it. I'm a little hesitant, but I'm trying to grab the Colts one real quick here. Uh the Colts I'm have an alternate Minnesota win total. You, you have to if you like the Colts under nine, plus yes. two hundred. That's an alternate win total at DraftKings. Under nine, so eight or low. Our plus projections two. are screaming to take that bet. Colts under nine for plus two hundred. Plus two hundred. Mm -hmm. Useful titles asking, can Robert Wood was run yet? I'm not sure, but Traylon Burks has had asthma and other issues that have kept him off the field all during minicamp, which is scary. Aside. So that takes care of the Indianapolis Colts. Again, a reminder, uh, if you are watching right now on Twitch or YouTube, please make comments during the show. We love to respond to your comments and questions that the Almanac is available now with an FO Plus subscription. The Amazon printed version is available on Amazon now, so go out and get it. JP here wrote the Jacksonville and Indianapolis chapters. So let's talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars, who I've got to say emotionally... This is not objectively based on our projections. Emotionally, are kind of my favorite to win the division. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> they have the lowest projection okay, in the division. Okay. They have the lowest they... projection in the division. But just hear me out for a second. Like thinking about possibilities. Trevor Lawrence is better than he showed last year. Plus, Doug Peterson knows how to coach. Plus, the whole division is bad. Equals nine and eight division title. Uh, if if this Jaguars team wins nine games, I'll build the statue of Doug Peterson myself. <laughs> I will. I will a statue of Trevor come Lawrence. Come take ours. Yeah. Come take it. We got one outside the I'll, I'll take the statue from Philly and put it in the Duval Ring of Honor. The, ja I, ja Jaguars with seven point seven mean wins. They make the playoffs in thirty two point five percent of projections. Twenty fourth on <laughs> offense. Twenty third on defense. Easy schedule. Easy schedule. Plus oh, 450, man. Plus 450 to make the playoffs, by the way, Aaron. And I'm going to remind you, I, I would love the plus 450 to make the playoffs. I remind you, talking about the, the Colts and uh, turnovers per drive on defense, right? The Colts were near the top of the league. It regresses heavily. The Jacksonville Jaguars had the second lowest percentage of drives that ended with a takeaway of any team since 1993. <laughs> There is no way that happens again. That this team last year was disgusting to watch. Even watching them back again, it's just terrible. Oh, I'm not so arguing I was that. Up, <laughs> yeah, I was looking up some stats from last year for Trevor Lawrence, and he had a 74.4% on target percentage, which is right there at Matthew Stafford. Catchable pass percentage is right there with Stafford as well. Overall completion percentage, 59%. Oh, God. What is happening here? And then the Jaguars receivers were 18th in receptions on catchable passes and led the NFL in drops. That's that cannot happen. That no, that won't happen this upcoming year, mainly because one of the things that stood out about Jacksonville this offseason and just in who they hired this is a very professional team. Like this is a very professional coaching staff. The one of the things that that about Urban Meyer was this is not a professional coaching staff. A lot of guys that were new, a lot of guys with no experience, counting the head coach who didn't know who was playing and who wasn't. You had there was no vision on offense or defense. You you cannot pick out what they did well. Like they wanted to get into some games, they wanted to get into 12 personnel and run the ball a lot. Mm -hmm. Evidence by Urban Meyer saying he wanted team, this team to run for 250 yards and pass for 250 yards every game. Like, man, you are not playing Akron. You are Akron. <laughs> you are Akron. <laughs> so, but now you can tell with Doug Peterson, with the staff they brought in, like Brinson Buckner, like Mike McCoy, you have a lot of experience not only in NFL locker rooms as a player, but as a coach. You can tell there's a vision offensively. And that's just the big – that's the most refreshing thing. You you now have a vision for this team. You can see what you want to do on offense. You know what Trevor Lawrence is going to look like. The defense is going to require a little bit more projection, mainly because you're bringing in a whole bunch of new guys. You're going to be playing a lot of rookies. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a first-year defense coordinator. Yeah. He's coming from Tampa Bay, Mike Caldwell. I think there's going to be a lot of five-man fronts, a lot of blitzes. Is going to be reliant on if Trevon Walker can be Trevon Walker early. If he can play really well against the run, which I think he should, and he'll start developing as a pass rusher, I can see like six wins. Uh, that was my early projection going into the season. I'm like, if we get six wins, I'll be fine. This team goes nine and eight. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> It's really an emotional. I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely honest. It's an emotional reaction, but it is basically if Urban Meyer is as bad as we all feel he was, and Doug Peterson is good, which I think we all agree he's an above-average coach, and Lawrence is as talented as we all thought he was coming out of college. Like this team should be a lot better than it was last year. Last year really was a nightmare. And even if you look at the roster now, this roster is a lot more talented than they were last year. There's a lot more depth at corner. There's better linebacker play. The offensive line largely remains the same outside of Brandon Scherf, but the receiver room will possibly get better with the addition of Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. Evan Ingram is going to add something as a receiver. So you hope that this team 
can get better offensively right. because you're start you're starting from ground zero. You're starting from the bottom. If you show any signs of progress, it'll be fine. May I just share with you guys uh, that the Jacksonville Jaguars, their training facility is not ready for the start of training camp. So they will be doing training camp at the local Episcopal High School. That sounds like the like 83 Los Angeles Raiders when they moved to Los Angeles and they had no training facility and they worked at some high school and they were like doing drills on the blacktop. Right, right. And, and it's just like on the one hand, and it's true. It's true what we're saying. Professionalism has returned and Doug Peterson brings that. And like all these veterans coming in are good quality veterans, not last gasp veterans like they had last year. On the other hand, they're going to spend a couple of weeks working out at the local high school. So they're still the Jaguars deep, deep down in their hearts and souls. And I, I definitely see the, the leap from comedy to mediocrity. And I also understand the concept that mediocrity can win the division potentially. It's just, uh, you know, I'm looking at Mike Vrabel and Frank Reich and the veterans they've assembled and the guys who've been there. And it's like, they're going to let this happen. <laughs> like there's a risk. This team rises up on them and they don't like reach back somehow and find a way of getting, you know, their guys together. And a veteran like Matt Ryan doesn't say, I'm going to win this damn game against the Jaguars. I, I mean, I I'm going to be honest. I don't love all the moves they made. They made so many moves in the off season. Evan Ingram. Well, we lost we lost Aaron there. Another thing, if he doesn't come back in a second, I'm not as high on the Texans as our our systems are. Aaron said that the Texans were among the favorites to win a division, and I almost fell out this chair. <laughs> I I am shocked. The Houston Texans are winning this division. I'm, come I, I this. <laughs> They were getting so hard. They were getting odds to have the worst record in the NFL. They had odds down in like, in like the competitive plus four fifty, plus three fifty. And I've been on radio talking about it. And it's like I understand what our system says. Our system says, well, you know, Jerry Hughes can still play. Mario Addison can still play. Brandon Cooks is pretty good, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets them to a certain level. But our system getting the Texans up to eight wins, I, 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 I it's staggering to think about. This Texans team is also a lot of projection. You're projecting the defensive back group to be really good with two starters and two rookies in the secondary as starters in Derek Stingley and Jalen Petrie. You're hoping for John Mechie to come back from a torn ACL and look like exactly how he looked at Alabama. Right. You're projecting Davis Mills to be as good as or better than he was last year, which I think I think Davis Mills is fine. He's a fine quarterback, but I don't think he's a game changer. You're also counting on the offensive line being good, which, again, yeah. I don't think is going to happen. Right, right. You've got Tunsil and nothing else. And Davis Mills, I always say, the best quarterback no one ever saw, no one ever watched him. You know, he, he would put these good numbers up in these games, kind of throwing – within the 10 yard lines from the pocket, doing some rollout stuff, et cetera. And then, you know, they, they beat the Chargers because Rex Burkhead runs for 300 yards. Like, well, at Davis Mills, he's really come on. He's the guy who had, he's almost like Osweiler folks. He's the guy who had four or five starts where he looked okay uh, in a very structured situation or in losses. And it's one thing for us to say, okay, Trevor, I, could, I can actually see this scenario. Trevor Lawrence plays so well in his second year that they jump up to eight wins. I can see that. The idea of Davis Mills was like this miraculous find by this organization? See, I, I compared him to how Gardner Minshew played in, like, 2019, where he mm -hmm. came in and you see, like, oh, yeah, it, yeah. it's fine. It's pretty good. So you allow him to get this upcoming season and say, like, hey, if you're going to be a starter, now is your yeah. chance to prove it. And then he ultimately proves he cannot be a starter. That's where I think the Texans are. If Mills is fine, fine, keep him. If he's not good, you're going to be one of the worst teams in the league again. You're going to get a quarterback. Just go ahead and just restart again. But seeing them as, like, one of the favorites to win this division, that says a <laughs> lot about this division. Again, this is a bad division. Right. And it always seems to be, and yet you, it was hid by Derek Henry and Vrabel coming in and, and creating something in Tennessee, or it was hid for a while by Andrew Luck. I love the guard uh, – I love the Gardner Minshew comparison. It was almost the opposite kind of guy because Minshew would make three highlights per game, like in this ridiculous situation. It would be a 50 50 ball to Chark and they would get it. And for the rest of the game, like as a percentage pass where he was horrendous. Whereas Mills, it was kind of like dink, dinkity dunk, dink, dinkity dunk, 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 dunk. And then, well, we lost by eight points, but we're the Texans. Wasn't that a great effort that we played? And it's almost like this like super weak T Kirk Cousins. That like uh, you know is, is like a mirage on the stat sheet. 
It's like ve- it's like very 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 diet Gardner Minshew without without the pizzazz and the mustache and a really long neck. It's mm-hmm. it's very Gardner Minshewy. Very also like I just compare quarterbacks now on the scale of Kirk, and Davis Mills is on kind of a lower scale of Kirk. We're like okay if he is the median if Kirk Cousins if Kirk Cousins is the median, Davis Mills is. Below the Kirk line, it's like the Mendoza line in baseball. He's below the Kirk line. <laughs> By the way, you said Minshewy, and I'm thinking, yes, this is a cannabis edible. The Minshewy. <laughs> Someone needs to start that. I, I would trademark it. He would. I mean, he should trademark. Obviously, it's his name, his like this little his little face and the mustache on the on the cover of it. It'd be it'd be exciting. Oh, man, it's free game, free game right here, Gardner. <laughs> if you're listening, Minshewy. Hit me up. We can talk about it. We, we can make a business out of that. Help me help you. <laughs> Amazing. Aaron is struggling to get back on the on the webcast, by the way. Um, Travis Etienne is coming back. This should, this should be fun. I think Travis Etienne is a very fun player. I think the concept or like I understand the idea. Mm-hmm. behind what Travis Etienne can do. I think lining him up at receiver, putting him at running back, it's a very good use of his skill set mm-hmm. in terms of getting speed in the game. Mm-hmm. It's just, again, it's very hard for me to project a running back coming off a list Frank injury. Right. Like, it's very – like, I say the same thing about James Robinson. I think James Robinson is fantastic. Uh-huh. But I really am a little bit concerned about him coming off of an Achilles injury because a lot of running backs coming off of foot injuries or lower body injuries, they're not the same players as they used to be. So it will be interesting to see how explosive Travis Etienne looks coming off of that list Frank injury. But if he's anywhere close to what he was at Clemson, this is a lot of speed that they're adding to a roster that really, really needs it. As much as Urban Meyer talked about four to six, A to B, this was a very slow team, especially when DJ Chart got hurt. Hi, man. Hi. I've never had this problem before. This is new. I've moved to a new place in the house to hope that it – well, I've never had connection issues on any show, so this is a little weird. I don't know what happened. Good luck. It went off the rails as it was the moment you left. We started talking about edibles. Uh, useful title saying that the Min Chewy cannot be any worse than the Randall Cunningham candy bar. I didn't remember it until you mentioned it. Now I remember it had scrambled peanuts in it. The Randall Cunningham scrambled candy bar has scrambled peanuts. <laughs> I had That's to have suggested that at some point in my uh, misspent youth, but I don't have, I don't remember what it tasted like. The Randy candy. That's so disgusting. <laughs> scrambled peanuts. I, I don't know what the idea was there. <laughs> you, you ate it and you went into a fog. And that ah. takes us back to the, yes, it takes us back to the, the Minchus. So- so what was the prop bet again you said about the Jaguars making the playoffs? Plus what? The Jaguars to make the playoffs is at plus 450. I'll look up some others while we're here. Plus 450, I, I don't like it. It just sounds like you're just throwing something at a thing there. I, I recognize the logic behind what you were saying. But uh, I have some alternate season win totals. Oh, you're going to like this one, Aaron. Over seven and a half wins for the Jaguars at plus 200. I think I like the playoffs at plus 450 better. Yeah, because if, if they get to eight. Because if they get to eight or nine, they're they're going to win the division the way if, if it goes the way we think it's going to go. Like what I can't imagine is a world where Jacksonville goes nine and eight but doesn't win the division. Yeah, that's a good point. Because if they go nine and eight, it's going to be in part because they go, they win three out of four against the Titans and Colts and push those teams down. Yeah. You also have uh, the Jaguars. Good. The Jaguars make the playoffs. I have a Jaguar chef hat and an apron. I will wear that on the live stream if they make the playoffs. (laughs) Go Jags. Go Trevor Lawrence. All right. If they make the playoffs, I'll wear the full thing. On this stream, where did you get a Jaguar chef's hat? Amazon. They have everything. Okay, then why did you get a Jaguar chef's hat? Because I went to the Jaguars Bengals game on Thursday night, and I needed Jaguar stuff to wear, so I bought a chef hat and an apron, and I wore it to Paul Brown, 
and I watched Trevor Lawrence be great, and then they lose, and then Urban Meyer starts canoodling with women that aren't his wife in Cincinnati, <laughs> and that's where it went all downhill. You're in the the kitchen of the bar making the wings while he was getting a lap the lap dance with your chef's hat on. That's what was going on. That's right. I, that's exactly what happened. They, they let me on for a couple hours. I yep. had to cook something up for Urban. <laughs> Possibly was not good just to make sure he knows that he's not a good coach. I did wear it to class one day oh. after um after they beat the uh, Dolphins in London. I wore the hat and the apron to class. Aaron, the guy who owns a Jaguars chef's hat and apron is less excited about the Jaguars than you are. I know. I guess I just have this this uh, irrational love of Trevor Lawrence. I love Trevor Lawrence. I've been hurt by this team before, though. Yeah. I, I have been down this road of optimism and excitement. And I you mean, know it leads me four and thirteen. That's exactly where this road leads. Yeah. I, I. I. You know. I mean. I don't. I'd say I don't think you're going to get the. 2021 Bengals out of this, but the fact is the 2021 Bengals by our numbers were an average team that snuck into the championship of a division that was having a really down year and then went on a run in the playoffs. I don't see that happening here. I'm not a Zay Jones guy, (laughs) but I mean, they overpaid Christian Kirk, but I like Christian Kirk. I like Marvin Jones. Um, the offensive line is is reasonable. It's not terrible. Brandon Scherf is a nice addition. You know, the defense is absolutely going to have more takeaways than it did last year. And it's just a bad division. And it's just, we all feel like Meyer just sucked so much out of this team last year. If we really feel that way, then they've got to be a lot better. Mm-hmm. It's not by the numbers. I'm not, I'm yeah. telling you it's emotional. I'll stay. I'll stay on the seven side of the seven point seven win projection. I'm gonna stay on that side of it. Look, man, I the numbers and my mind is telling me six wins, but my heart believes believes in the second year leap, the Joe Burrow like second year leap from this team. And you know what? Sure, let's let's go. Let's go eight and nine. Let's go nine and eight. And win this division. But these. If these Jaguars win this division, I will not know what to do. Because yeah. this I mean, team... I will say the biggest difference between this and last year's Bengals is they don't have the receivers. <laughs> yeah, Trevor Lawrence is basically going to have to or, be or the pass rush God as a quarterback, and, or, the or the pass rushes, or, whoa, or the safety whoa, whoa, play. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is Josh Allen really worse than Trey Hendrickson? Yeah, I'm going to say that's fine. I'm comfortable with that. Yes. No, I think Josh Allen is pretty good. Josh Allen is I pretty think... good. Trey Henderson was a really good addition to that team last year who played extremely well. How about safety? I, I think he's one of the best safeties in the I league. Josh the Allen. Okay, safety is a big difference. I, yes, absolutely. I, I think Josh Allen is more talented, but I think Trey Hendrickson has better results. That makes sense. Like he, he's a better player. I think Josh Allen has the talent to get there, but he's – see so many doubles because the rest of the pass rush is really, really bad that you just... So a lot depends on Trevon Walker. Direction. It depends a lot, a lot depends on Trevon Walker. Depends a lot on Devin Lloyd being the chess piece that he was at Utah. And this team really also depends on Andre Sisco being good. Yep. I know a lot a lot last year, I think Andre Sisco is good and can be good, but you just never saw him play because Urban Meyer forgot who he was. And it's just <laughs> playing Andrew Wingard who makes me want to jump off a cliff. Andrew Wingard is not a good safety, not a good football player. I wish Andre Sisco would get more snaps. <laughs> Rayshon Jenkins coming off foot injury. I just hope Andre Sisco is good. But I think this cornerback room is really versatile. I really like the addition of Darius Williams. It allows him to be a lot more versatile in their matchups, with a lot more receivers going into the slot now with, like, Cooper Cup, A.J. Brown, a lot of bigger bodies in there. You're not going to put 5'10 Darius Williams in the slot exclusively. You're going to let him play the matchups. Put Tyson Campbell there, be a bigger body. Put Shaquille Griffin there and allow Darius Williams to kind of be your chess piece to match up against teams better. So I really like the pieces. I just have to see it in like in action. 
Like I can see it on paper what the you idea is. You see it in action on a high school field. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Episcopal high school field. <laughs> shout out to Trick. Shout out to Trinity Christian. Those open practices gonna be on a high school football field. <laughs> Travis Etienne on a high school football field. What could possibly go wrong? Let's hope not. Let's hope. Let's not. Let's, let's hope not. Yes, yeah. we don't want Jacksonville to suffer think about that. injuries because we've seen that we've seen that show before. Yes. All right, that does it for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Colt, Colonel Kurt says, JP is convincing me that my intuition and Aaron's emotion are correct. Jacksonville AFC South champions. Let's do it. Let's no. ride. Let's no. ride. Look, we're going to be Russell have Wilson. Jason Doug Peterson. Got to have Jason gonna be, Trevor Lawrence. Going to be like uh, Russell Wilson. Jaguars Nation. Let's ride. Gotta have Jason Derrick Henry blowing out his knee. Let's do it. I'm I'm all in on this. Let's go, Jacksonville Jaguars, AFC South champions. I'll wear, wear the that chef, apron man. and hat on this live stream. If they win the division, they go to the playoffs. Great. We talked Colonel Kurtz into something. No way that comes back to haunt us. All right, <laughs> that does it for today's Football Outsiders Almanac preview show. Uh, don't forget to get the Almanac FO Plus subscriptions. Gets you the PDF version of the Almanac. Amazon has the printed version right now. We're doing these shows Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next few weeks, covering two teams a day. So the next show is going to be Tuesday at 1 p.m. I believe it's Scott Spratt and another guest to be uh, announced. And we are going to do the Buffalo Bills, our Super Bowl favorites, and the Miami Dolphins, also a team that Scott wrote about <laughs> that is not our Super Bowl favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Tuesday. Don't forget to like the show. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Don't forget to tell your friends about the show. We're going to be here for the next seven weeks previewing every team, two teams a day, two days a week. Don't forget about Splash Play 2 tomorrow, I think 2 p.m. Eastern, talking fantasy football. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Mike. Mike's going on vacation. Mike will not be here for the next few shows. I miss We're everyone. Take, take some time off. Heading to Europe. Heading to Europe on an EF tour. I'm going to be in Budapest, Prague, and Krakow, and then we take Berlin. Uh, and I can't wait for it, and I'll be back as soon as I can to talk prop bets with y'all. Like the Jaguars on a yearly basis, he's going to Europe. <laughs> yes. All right. That does it for our show, everybody. We'll see